Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. I think we're going to go live now, and I'm sure people will be joining us as we're going along. And you're very welcome to this live panel discussion. It's part of Edison's Open Forum Cannabinoids 2021 series. My name is Vivian Parry. I'm a science writer and broadcaster and your host today. And indeed, I've been the host throughout the series of interviews with key voices in the sector. So the idea for this whole series came out of Edison's recent report on biosynthesis, taking the market to new heights. And I do recommend reading it. It's a fascinating read. We've got an absolutely terrific uh, panel with us today. Our subject is, could cannabinoid biosynthesis be the next big thing? And let me introduce the panel to you. We have Nick Davis of Memory Crystal. We have Randy Barron of Pinnacle, Roy Lipsky of Creo, and Trevor Peters of Willow Bio. And I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves and their company or organization in a little more detail. So uh, let's go to you, first of all, uh, Randy Barron. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Randy Barron. Like Vivian said, I represent a firm called Pinnacle Associates. We're a U.S.-based um, manager of money. We manage about $7.5 billion. And my because role on this panel, for good or for ill, is I wrote for Barron's uh, The Investor's Guide to Investing in Synthetic Biology. So I come from it from the top down side, and we're going to talk a lot today about the cannabinoids top up. But I think the science overall, even beyond cannabinoids, is fascinating. And in many ways, we're at the dawn of the uh, fourth industrial revolution. Thank you. Roy Lipsky. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Roy Lipsky, CEO of Creo. Uh, Creo is a biosynthesis of cannabinoids company, one of the first in the world to start working in this space. We are a partnership with one of the best names in synthetic biology, a company called Genomatica out in San Diego, California. Um, and after many years of research and building the largest patent portfolio in this space, uh, we're actually in commercial production now uh, at a facility here in the US uh, operated by one of the largest multinational chemicals and ingredients companies. Thank you, Trevor Peters. Thanks, Vivian, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Trevor Peters. I'm president and CEO of Willow Biosciences. Uh, Willow is a biotechnology company uh, that is focused on synthetic biology, uh, in particular, uh, our first set of products, cannabinoids. Uh, we've been around for uh, about three or four years. Uh, we're public uh, on the Toronto Stock Exchange uh, here in Canada. Uh, we're based primarily in Canada, but we have a big presence as well uh, in the Bay Area, uh, San Francisco. Uh, like Creo, uh, we are also today in uh, commercial production. Uh, we've just uh, really gotten started this year with our first cannabinoid, uh, cannabigerol. Uh, we produce that with a large contract manufacturing organization uh, based in Europe uh, with ingredients uh, intended primarily for the European and UK markets. And finally, last but absolutely not least, uh, Nick Davis. Thanks, Vivian. Um, hi, morning to our friends on the other side of the pond, um, and evening to anyone in Australia, and good afternoon for everyone in Europe. Um, I'm Nick Davis. I'm senior partner of Memory Crystal, which is a, a law firm based here in London. Uh, for today's purposes, I'm a capital markets lawyer by, by training, and I was responsible for the first listing of a, a cannabis company on the London Stock Exchange. So I've had a, a very active role in opening up the market for companies like the ones that we're joined by today to raise public funds on the markets um, and continue to see a really fascinating journey of which today is is fairly new for me. So I'm I'm the new kid on the block and and learning all the time. Spent lunch jamming up on photosynthesis and, and all things interesting, but the experts will tell us more about it. So that's me. But as you'll discover, regulation is a key thread that runs through the development of this sector. Now, to start us off, I really want to lay out the landscape because I have to tell you, although all of you folk are absolutely steeped in this, if you stop people on the street and say cannabinoids, they usually look rather startled and say, what are they? So 
what I want to do is go to uh, Roy. Tell me where this has all come from, because this wasn't a, six, a sector that even existed uh, five years ago. So what are we talking about here? Well, I think a few things to make clear. Cannabinoids are a class of compounds, actually one of the most exciting class of compounds known to man. Um, there have been off limits for science because of legal concerns uh, uh, for a very long time. We've heard of CBD, we've heard of THC, the intoxicating cannabinoid, but there are actually over a hundred of these that exist in nature. Many of them are quite rare in the plants, but nonetheless, all of them do slightly different things. Um, cannabinoids are compounds that have three uh, modes of action. They're the antibacterial, antioxidant, and they bind with the, with the body's endocannabinoid system and help regulate many functions from sleep, pain, inflammation, et cetera. Now, where has this all come from? Well, this all began really with the sort of dere the, the deregulation of cannabis in California, which slowly spread across the country here in the US, initially in medical and then in recreational. And, and what's amazing about this revolution is that it's not been driven by science. And science has really only catching up to what these ingredients do. It's been driven by the fact that they actually work and people report that these, these compounds are helping them and they tell their friends and their neighbors and their family members. And that's how it has spread. So whilst there's a lot of hype around CBD right now and CBD is in everything for everything, which certainly it doesn't do, let's not forget that these compounds as a class, cannabinoids, actually do have uh, real effects. And that's why we have got to where we are today. Thank you. And the endocannabinoid system, which tripped off your tongue very easily, but that's a, a, a system of kind of like locks and keys, isn't it? So it's, uh, first of all, there are masses of receptors in the brain, uh, but there are also masses of receptors in uh, elsewhere in the body. And they have a particular involvement, say, with the immune system. For me, yeah, absolutely correct. So the endocannabinoid system, actually, we only found out about this in the 1990s. It turns out our own bodies make cannabinoids and they bind to these receptors throughout the body, which are like a signaling system. It's, it's an ancient signaling system that goes all the way back to when mammals first emerged. And these cannabinoids bind to these uh, receptors and help regulate them. Now, every different cannabinoid binds in a slightly different way. And so really, I guess the key point here is, whilst today CBD is available and we're using it for everything, actually there's probably another cannabinoid that is better than CBD for many of the things that CBD are being used, is being used for today. And as we begin to tap into these other cannabinoids, we're gonna be able to create much more effective and targeted products than we can today with just CBD and THC. Now, I suspect our audience has already got questions and you can put them in the Q&A function and we will come to them in due course. But I now want to go to Nick because regulation has played a key role here. Tell me a bit about the history of this and where we are now with regulation. Well, regulation and prohibition. Um, so, yeah, if you go back to the 1920s um, and the advent of opiate medicines. Um, back in, in the early days, cannabis, cannabinoids were being used for medical purposes, have been for thousands of years. Um, and then war on drugs um, and all sorts of geopolitical stuff that we won't go into today meant that, that cannabis became yeah, a narcotic and it became yeah, a, a, a product that was no longer available other than on the black market um so from a regulatory point of view it was fairly simple it was yeah it was a class a drug in the uk and whatever the equivalent is on the other side of the pond and then as roy alluded to <coughs> um and trevor will have seen with his own eyes our, our friends in north america on both sides of the borders kind of started to move the goalposts and legalization of medical cannabis was the starting point. Um, GW Pharmaceuticals that lots of people will know, one of the UK's great exports that nobody ever knew about, um, started work in this space, was the first 
cannabis company, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but working with synthetic cannabinoids um, and working very happily listed on AIM as a biotech company and wine forward to earlier this year sold for multi-billions of pounds. So what's happened, and I'll, I'll focus mainly on the UK because that's my area of expertise, is that there's been a, a, a regular and, and kind of constant rescheduling of various cannabinoids for the purposes of, in the UK, medicine. So you know, a focus today, cannabinoids in general, um, CBD, as we've discussed already, started popping up everywhere. Um, and there have been various regulatory movements. In the UK, CBD is legal as long as it has no THC in it. Um, and that's obviously a key reason why the discussions we're going to be having today are so interesting because biosynthesis takes away those regulatory concerns. And then we had, from a food point of view, novel foods, um, which the guys can talk about in greater detail. But cannabis started popping up um, by CBD in toothpaste and dog food and everything and anything. You walked into Holland and Barrett and there was a new skew on the shelves. Um, as a result of that, novel foods, European directive, followed Brexit by a, a UK directive. But at the same time, the yeah, my area, and I think the focus for today was capital. What was happening was I went to Canada about five years ago, which is where this my entry started, and all my mates at the time who'd been into mining and oil and gas were suddenly happily driving around in new Bentleys because they moved into cannabis. Um, and I started to look at it, and the regulation was behind. It's always been behind. It's playing catch up. But why forward to today, um, medical cannabis is legal in the UK. Um, and API, the product that's going to go into those medicines, um, is the focus. And making sure that that medicine is available on a regular um, basis, it repeats itself time after time, I think is leading us into this biosynthesis point of of the development. And so you saw cellular goods list in the UK um, who are looking at, at synthetic cannabinoids. Um, they haven't actually, as far as I'm aware, issued a product yet, um, but they will. Um, and that was obviously the first time that it was mentioned in the UK. And I'm starting to get clients, um, people talking to me with their businesses. Again, North America is light years ahead and that's why the panel is as it is but from a uk point of view there aren't any investment opportunities really to to look at a company like creo or, or others um so hearing randy's view as an investor on on where this is going and and from a regulatory point of view it's simpler yeah you, know, you take away the narcotics issues around thc when you're producing CBD or CBG from a synthetic point of view. So from a, a regulatory point of view, and we're working on half a dozen listings in London at the moment of various areas within the cannabis space, um, to be able to go to the regulator and say, right, this is a synthetic product. It's made from algae or whatever else it's made from, and, and it's got zero THC. It's not cannabis. There's no plant. Um, I think from a regulatory point of view is going to be a very attractive proposition. And on the back of that, and I guess, again, key for today is there's lots of investors in the UK, investment funds, who just won't invest in cannabis at the moment. They, it's not that they can't, but they won't. Their compliance officers are not comfortable that what they're looking at is legal. And so this is, hey, so in that's my a, mind, that's an a, evolution. So that's a really uh, good explanation of where we were on the regulation. But I want to come to Trevor because, Trevor, you're a Canadian and Canada has played a particular role in this story. And where you've got to so far, I think, is is very instructive um, to the whole story. It is. Yeah, we've, um, you know, in Canada, we've had medical uh, cannabis um, in a legal form for probably close to two decades. 
Um, and then recently in 2018, uh, the, our federal government uh, legalized cannabis entirely under the Cannabis Act, um, which was a great first step. Um, there's still lots of work to be done. I would say that whilst we're, we, we may appear to be leading, uh, there's still a lot of work that Health Canada has to do in terms of uh, updating or revising the act uh, to account for uh, some rather simple things. Um, but that said, uh, it has definitely opened up uh, the ability for science to start to catch up. I know we mentioned that earlier, uh, how science has really lagged. Uh, we're fortunate here in Canada that we are, uh, our operations here are, uh, are licensed, we're you know, federally legal, all the cannabis touching that we do. Uh, so it does provide us a real opportunity to work with the plant, uh, even though we are biosynthetically producing cannabinoids. Uh, we do uh, understand the host organism, the cannabis plant, as, as best we can to really feed us insight uh, into how we ultimately engineer our host organism uh, to produce uh, cannabinoids. Uh, and um, uh, as uh, Roy mentioned earlier, there's over 100 cannabinoids in the plant and the, and the plant makes each one slightly differently. Uh, and so that's really key for us to be able to, to again, work with the plant uh, and, and be able to biosynthetically produce cannabinoids. Uh, but it's also lent a lot of, I would say, um, uh, endocannabinoid research. So within uh, the human system, uh, and that's something else that we see a lot of the universities here in Canada doing uh, and really providing good data, good science uh, to support uh, how cannabinoids can deal with certain indications. And that's, I think, what's so exciting about the plant. Again, to follow on Roy's point is that um, you know, THC does one thing, CBD does one thing, CBG does another, and really understanding how those cannabinoids interact with our, our bodies, our endocannabinoid system, will ultimately allow us to treat, um, you know, indications uh, in a much better fashion, a much more targeted fashion. So, yeah, it's been good. We've got a lot of catch up to do here still on the reg side, but uh, Canada has definitely uh, led the way and we hope to continue to lead the way. So, Randy, is all of this making your heart beat faster as, as an investor? You know, what are you seeing as uh, the trends that are pushing this forward? I mean, clearly, deregulation is a very important part of it. And I'm also getting, I suspect, actually, the lack of the, the lessening of the stigma that's associated with cannabis. But what else, in your view, is making this sector so appealing? Well, Vivian, the first thing I'd say to your question is anytime you ask a question or host one of these groups, my heart beats faster. So that's the first thing. <laughs> the second thing is um, we're, at a, we're at a really fascinating moment in time where there's a generational shift going on. To, to just follow up on some of the earlier comments, Nick talked about CBD. I'm of the opinion, and, and because we're in the space, we've channel checked some of this, that when you go to the store or the supermarket, the Tesco, wherever, and you get your topical with CBD in it, um, Charlotte's Web in the US is a great example of that. The actual amount of CBD in those items is de minimis because like Nick and Roy were saying, the concern over THC was such, at least in the States, that if you have any measurable amount, you're out of business. So the business risk is not worth taking. And thus, while CBD is effective, like Trevor's saying now, we're at the the cusp of a new day where there are other cannabinoids that um, are probably better. And the example, of course, is CBG, which is five or 10x more effective than CBD. And what's happening in the unit economics today is that a lot of these players, Creo, Willow, Amaris, Ginkgo, are all able to make this in a lab with higher purity. I think Willow and, and Trevor, you can correct me if I'm wrong, 99% pure. I mean, this is CBG is 1% of the cannabinoid plant. By the way, there are other cannabinoids, like Roy said, CBN, other things that cost you know, 16,000 a kilo currently. And what's going to happen, and this is what gets me excited, Vivian, is that the unit economics are shifting to such a point where three or four years from now, you're going to have an aggregate supply shift such that CBG is going to be produced at $500 a kilo or less versus CBD. D today as a plant costs probably two to three times that. And what I'm saying, you know, in sum is that CBD as a market is not going to exist in the same way it does today, five or 10 years from now. And it's because of science, it's because of unit economics, and it's because of purity. So I think that's a pretty exciting moment in time that we're at that hinge point 
where science has shown up and can really help evolve uh, an industry. That's very helpful. And Trevor, I wonder, let's now introduce the subject of biosynthesis. So can you give the guide that you give to your mum about what biosynthesis involves? Yeah, bi biosynthesis at its core is, is uh, simple in, in concept, obviously difficult to ultimately engineer uh, and perfect. Um, it's really just taking a different organism uh, and designing that organism to do uh, what a plant or animal ultimately does. Uh, biosynthesis is used today to produce uh, insulin, artemisinin, several other you know, high value uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients for, for, uh, for drugs. Um, and applying that to cannabinoids, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, understanding how the plant uh, ultimately makes uh, a cannabinoid or a set of cannabinoids, uh, and then taking that information uh, those metabolic pathways and ultimately reproducing them in our case in a yeast cell uh, and allowing that yeast cell uh, to be fed essentially sugar uh, and propagate over a five to ten day period uh, and be able to produce what the plant uh, would do. Um, that's really as, as in a nutshell, uh, Vivian, as I could uh, describe it for you. Uh, but uh, Roy, um, uh, there are other organisms. I think your approach is bacteria rather than yeasts. Yes, absolutely. So the, the, the two kind of main workhorses in biosynthesis, and what I would add to what Trevor said earlier is this is not just in pharmaceuticals. Biosynthesis has made major inroads into consumer products, vitamins, flavors, fragrances. When you drink a flavored mineral water drink that tastes of grapefruit that doesn't come from grapefruit, it's biosynthesized. Really? And then, really? It doesn't come from yeah. grapefruit? Oh. And, that's, and that's better. Think of the poor grapefruit and all those trees. <laughs> and water and fertilizer that you need to grow them. But um, you know, to Randy's point, this is a technology that is one of the most important technologies that are going you know, exist in the 21st century. It is part of our solution to global warming. Um, so anyway, um, uh, there are two main uh, forms for this, bacteria and yeast. We went down a bacterial route where the only major player to do that because it gives us freedom to operate. The IP space there was much, much less crowded than it was around, around yeast. Uh, and just to finish off on Trevor's uh, very good explanation, if you want to visualize what this looks like, it's not really a lab. Think of it as a microbrewery. These are fermenters. You put your bug in, you feed them sugar, give them some air, let them do their thing, and, and within two to three days of bacteria or five to 10 for a yeast, they're finished doing their process. Instead of making alcohol, they produce cannabinoids. Excellent, your mums will and be proud of you. <laughs> and Vivian, if I could just, if I could just add one thing yes. to that, I think it's important as you frame the biosynthetic opportunity to also understand that we're at a moment in the investing landscape where socially responsible investments yes, are becoming more and more Yes, I was going to exactly come important. to this point. And, you know, uh, as an example, someone once said to me, I, I was once looking at, at a gold mine and I sat with the CEO and he said, what's more harmful to the earth? Is it this little posted stamp where we go into the earth or is it the fields of agriculture? So think about the fact that we're creating, in this case, we're talking about cannabinoids without using you know, the vast majority of water that a cannabinoid plant would use. And so again, pure, better for the world and better for vesting. It's kind of a really wonderful uh, Holy Trinity, if you will. And indeed, we've got a question come in from James Ware, who says there's been a huge focus on climate change. You know, COP26 is in very much in our minds and a growing trend the products that are promoted with terms like biodegradable, sustainable, carbon neutral. And uh, the team has tweeted that biosynthetic cannabinoids are cleaner and greener than grown. Uh, and indeed, uh, there they are. Um, I mean, there. Although there have been quite a lot of efforts trying to, and you'll see some of these interviews um, on the Edison Open Forum. But there's been a trend towards producing plants that are better at producing particular uh, cannabinoids. But even so, they they consume a lot of water and energy if they're grown inside, and a lot of water. And they, they also generate a lot of waste as, uh, as well. Um, Trevor, is that the case? 
Yeah, uh, I saw a study recently uh, to one of the U.S. universities, I can't remember which, but the U.S. marijuana uh, uh, grow every year is the equivalent, I think, of 13 million cars uh, in terms of CO2 production. Uh, you know, we, uh, processes like ours or Creos, we would use probably 5% or produce rather probably something on the order of 5% of that amount uh, of CO2 in terms of like a kilogram equivalent on a production basis. Um, so the process is definitely far better uh, in terms of, um, you know, impact on the environment from a CO2 production basis. Um, the bio waste, uh, the biomass that's um, essentially just disposed of after uh, grow, whether outdoor or indoor, doesn't matter. Uh, again, same thing. There's a, a lot of biomass that uh, is ultimately disposed of worthless. Uh, and then uh, the water usage, uh, a cannabis plant consumes an enormous amount of water, uh, whereas processes like ours on the biosynthetic route, water is recycled. Uh, the biomass waste is is de minimis. It's very small. It's really just the spent yeast or the the spent microbe, um, and so it's a it, it again has a far less environmental impact. And frankly, that's a it's a, a big deal uh, for folks like Randy on the investment side, uh, but also for the people that uh, say Roy and and myself would interact with in terms of customers. Uh, it's very important for them uh, to be able to have a solution that does not, um, you know, further add or accumulate uh, to their existing uh, Im uh, impact or, or footprint uh, on the environment. So it's very appealing uh, for especially for large consumer goods types companies uh, to be able to find a solution like ours uh, that ultimately will either reduce uh, or uh, at least not add uh, to their existing environmental footprint. And Randy, and that's the next big step, isn't it? If you can persuade the big companies, you know, the kind of the Procter and Gambles or the Unilevers of this world, so that actually the purity of the product is such that they're not going to get into trouble with anybody and the supply chain uh, is secure and it has these green credentials. And that actually signals a much potentially greater market for these products. And don't forget that it can be done at scale, right? Mm -hmm. The Unilevers of the world aren't going to go into business with a company they think can't meet their needs. Uh, the example here is Coke and Pepsi, right? Like why have Coke and Pepsi not gone to a healthier version of sugar? We know sugar is terrible for our bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about, Nick, you talked about class A drugs, like sugar probably should be one. I'm a sugar addict. I'm allowed to say that. Um, the, the reason is that a lot of the biosynthetic players, because the uh, universe is so nascent and so new, it still was being proven. However, Willow, Creo, I think you guys are doing in 10,000 and 20,000 liter vats today. Amaris is doing 200,000 liter vats when they do their cannabinoids. I mean, we're, we're really entering prime time. And one of the things that I'd like to add to what Trevor said is, you know, I, I meet with a lot of investors and the generational shift that's happening is if you're a younger investor, call it in your 20s or 30s, um, you ask about questions like this. When I started in the business three decades ago, people didn't ask about what you're sourcing and kind of what's your water usage. And these are really relevant questions that you have to talk about with companies today. Uh, one, one anecdote, if you don't mind, Vivian, uh, Amaris does a lot of flavor and fragrances, right? They just something called squalene, which saves the lives of 500,000 sharks a year. It's the best emollient, the best moisturizer in the world. When L'Oreal, so they supply 60%, this, this biosynthetic company now supplies 60% of the world's moisturizer call it and when l'oreal comes to their plant in brazil they're always shocked because they're looking to make sure you know the chain is going to be there that it's only one hectare of sugarcane is what produces all of what l'oreal is going to need so to what trevor was saying earlier you know the efficiency of this process is such we can really make leaps and bounds and like roy was saying whether it's three days or six days to do a generation you can very quickly discover where mistakes are or where you can scale and do it you know, from idea to commercial scale in, you know, nine months or a year. I think that's pretty remarkable. So, Nick, where are the big markets here? So I guess there will always be a market, if you like, for the artisan um, THC for, for recreational use, which is not what we're going to be talking about at all. Uh, then you have the wellness market, everything from dog biscuits, <laughs> 
I, I, I was rather trashing dog biscuits for CBD, but apparently they're a big thing and they're dogs. It's really good for dogs. Anyway, uh, <laughs> there's also um, the, the, so the wellness market, which is absolutely huge and booming. But the pharmaceutical market is coming up very, very quickly on the inside rails. Is that where you see the main market? Well, it, it's interesting because the the UK is is just beginning. So yeah, the sophistication of investors like Randy, um, yeah, there, there's one or two funds that are, are starting to look at it. It's still mainly family offices and and high net worths. Um, so from yeah, again from my world, um, and I. No doubt Roy and Trevor will tell us who the potential purchasers are of, of the product that they're producing. Um, it, there is a focus on medical uh, and the focus on medical is barriers to entry. Yeah, it, it doesn't take very long to develop a CBD brand. Um, and there's thousands of them and some are good and some are bad and some are bloody awful, to use a British phrase. Um, and the consumer doesn't really know yet what to do and where to go. And as we've already talked about, it's all word of mouth. Um, Amazon are starting to trial some product, which is great um, in the healthcare space. These are medicines. And these are, yeah, I got into this because my daughter has rare autoimmune diseases. And I went to Israel four years ago and started looking at what the cannabis plant was doing for some of those. But from my end, would I, if in due course there's a medicine produced, yeah, do I think that it's likely to be using APIs produced by these guys compared to yeah, a large harvest on the West Coast? Yeah, it does seem that way to me. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. And the ESG element of what we're talking about today, again, from a capital markets point of view, is just front and center on every conversation that we're having you know randy jokes about gold mines you know the, the world has moved on enormously and and it is something that people have asked me around you know big grows in southern europe um what's the carbon footprint of a cannabis grow in portugal um that that you want us to invest in how many yeah all the water recycling in the world so it, it it's just fascinating and and a fairly new thing to me and I think a fairly new thing to investors so this education you know when I first met Roy recently it was my first experience with this area of, of the industry. So, um, so tell me uh, Randy the, so we, we've got this nascent industry um, it's clear that the US and uh, well North America generally are ahead of the game but where is this going? Where do you see this sector in, say, five years' time? Well, even before I kind of give you my oracle outlook, which you take with a grain of salt, uh, Nick, Nick touched on something that I feel like the Sunday Times in London touches every couple of months, which is UK versus US investing, right? Uh, people are always surprised on a, on a general term that, um, you know, the, the FTSE is about 2% tech. Right. Compare that to the S&P, which is 40 percent plus with Tesla and all the other kind of tech things that have happened. And so the UK uh, investor, I'm speaking very generally here, tends to be the generalist. Right. And, and like Nick is saying, the generalists are slowly coming, pushing the rock up the hill to understand uh, the potential here. Obviously, the U.S. investors and certainly the Canadians, what Trevor's talking about, are ahead of the game when it comes yeah. to that. However, to, to steal the Martin Luther King quote, the arc of time comes towards uh, cannabinoids. And like I said, if you're disrupting an industry because you can make something at a third the cost with higher purity, it's only a matter of time before the existing industry either sues you to try and stop you, which is happening in the space, and which is a sign that it's coming, by the way, and or B, this gets out of the way or acclimate. So I think what's going to happen is like the big chemical guys in the world, the DSMs of the world, the Unilevers, like you mentioned before, are all going to get together and start saying, this is the future. We're going to start integrating this more and more. And you're going to, it's not going to be an either or conversation. It's going to be a much more inclusive corporate conversation at a Fortune 500 level. And I think we're already seeing the first steps in that. When you look at who the partners of these small companies, I mean, Creo and Willow are small. 
right? But when you look at who the partners are, small but lovely, I think obviously. It's, I mean, remarkably lovely. But, the, but guys, it's, who it's are very... you selling product to? <laughs> who, who are the customers? Uh, I'm hang intrigued. On, hang, on, hang on, Nick. Just, just, uh, that, j- just finish that that final thought, Randy. No, no. I, but I, I, Nick, Nick asked the good question. Like we, I'm not sure. And and Roy, I'd love to hear your take. I know you've experimented a lot, and you have a great commercial person. Uh, it's unclear exactly what the the CBG outlook is. I'll give you one example. Uh, Amaris, AMRS, publicly traded, has a has a, a a brand called Terrasana that they launched, which is CBG back. When you see what CBG is doing, it's literally getting rid of acne. Think about acne. The way that acne is treated uh, historically uh, is it's a chemical peel. You put acid on your face to make it go away. Well, how about if I gave you a solution that was moisturizing, I mentioned squalane earlier, and going to come in from the skin and work its way out with CBD to purify. So in three weeks, you're getting major cases of inflammation, which is what acne basically is, resolved. You're getting bone inflammation that's getting addressed. I mean, we are, it sounds a little, uh, a little bit like voodoo, right? But we're, we're dealing with things on a fundamental molecular level that up until now we have not been able to do. It's been a bill of goods, but yet the future is here, at least where comes inflammation. But Roy, I'd be curious to hear kind of what you yeah, think so the, Roy, the markets yeah, exactly. are Exactly. You're on the spot, Roy. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I've been itching to contribute here. Um, so, so we have a vision that cannabinoids will be in every household from personal care products through to, uh, uh, you know, medicines uh, and, and, and even, even just general consumer products. And in order to enable that transition, as Randy was saying, we need the mainstream consumer packaged good companies to adopt these ingredients. And to date, they haven't done that basically for two reasons, supply chain issues, scalability, consistency, reliability, environmental footprint, et cetera, and then legal complexity. The cannabis plant is a narcotic in most parts of the world, and anything that comes from cannabis is considered a narcotic. And a big consumer packaged good company is not going to develop a product that they can sell in only one country. They need products they can sell globally. And now with biosynthesis on the scene, this is the key to unlocking cannabinoids in mass markets. And if we have this conversation in 10 years time, we're not gonna be, you know, cannabinoids will be just a thing, just like salt or soap, and it's gonna be understood and taken for granted, and we won't be able to imagine a world where we didn't have them before. Now- Uh, Well, there's a very good question, uh, Roy, that's just come in, uh, which is, what will the final penetration of cannabinoids be? What percentage of the population might be ingesting them once the market is mature? Maybe they'll just add them to the drinking water. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know if it'll go like the way fluoride does, but, but actually that's a, a, an interesting connection there. So think of toothpaste. Pretty much every person uses toothpaste. I've seen some research uh, out of Belgium that showed that CBG, cannabigerol, our first product, is more effective at uh, killing bacteria that cause plaque and preventing plaque and reducing inflammation than all the major toothpaste side by side. So that's just an example of how these ingredients have the potential and will be all pervasive. And, and we might not, you know, the product will not be selling, oh, this is a CBD product. It'll just be an ingredient in there that we know is, is, is doing something and allowing you to make a claim around the product. Okay, let me ask some specific investor questions here. Um, And here's one that's come from uh, our audience. This is Lucy Allen. Do the current players in the market have a first mover advantage or would we expect others to come in with new technology and be far more competitive? Um, Trevor, let's go to you on that one. Yeah, the the, there's sort of two parts to that question, obviously. The the first mover advantage, uh, I think, First of all, the cannabinoid market over the next five to 10 years, as Roy just alluded to, is going to become enormous uh, and it's going to be varied. Uh, we're going to have certain cannabinoids for certain things. Uh, and so there's, in a way, a large playing field, if you will, um, in terms of, uh, you know, a number of entrants uh, being able to to participate, at least on the, the biosynthetic technology side. Um, so you know, being first, uh, absolute first, probably not that imperative. Um, but certainly being able to take 
you know, bench to pilot to scale, uh, very important uh, to be able to demonstrate that, especially for the consumer companies that really do want uh, assuredness around supply chain management. And that's probably the most important uh, aspect of biosynthesis really making inroads in this, uh, in this market. Um, the second part is, um, you know, new technologies. Uh, absolutely. I mean, we're, biosynthesis as a, as a technology is, is new. Um, really, you know, this century over the past two decades uh, with new gene editing technologies, et cetera, enabling us to be able to, to, uh, to accomplish the task of biosynthesis. So uh, absolutely, uh, that is, uh, there, there will be other uh, entrants that will try to come into the space. And for companies like my, ourselves, Willow, Creo, Amaris, and others, um, we always have to stay uh, ahead of that ultimately to remain competitive. And so there's really no resting on the laurels, uh, if you will, in terms of what we need to achieve uh, to stay competitive uh, within, within the marketplace. But certainly being able to work today as we are um, will give us an advantage over the next uh, five to 10 years to make sure that we stay uh, ahead of the game in terms of other entrants into the space. Now, this is a question for Nick and Randy, which is um, how quickly do you need to see sales starting to ramp up? From an Nick. investor point of view. Yeah. It, it's the eternal difference between the UK and the US. Um, yeah, Randy, no doubt, has invested in many companies over the years and is far better place to talk to me about this than I am, um, that were pre-revenue, probably never going to make a profit and worth billions of dollars. Um, the UK market likes to see revenue and it ideally likes to see a path to profit. Um, so again, these are technology businesses as I see it. They're biotechnology businesses and if the focus is in the medical space, and I keep coming back to that because that's very much my focus, um, this is a long game. And you know, supplying API into a drug development is going to be a long time. Alongside that though, the ability to, to produce API for acne and, yeah, and the, the holy grail of a Procter & Gamble or the others, PepsiCo, picking up and bringing cannabinoids into the mainstream. I guess that's what we're missing at the moment. You know, the day that you see Diet Coke with, can, with, with CBD enhanced or CBG or whichever the right cannabinoid is for what they're doing. And, you know, that's what people are looking for. That's that's the, the unicorn that I guess the guys that we're talking to today have the ability to penetrate those multinationals because, and we come back to where we started, from a compliance point of view, they de-risk. Yeah, um, Randy, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and, and I think, Vivian, to be quite frank, uh, revenue is the wrong multiple to use here. Uh, we're starting from such a small base that you could show huge percentage changes very easily. I think what matters more, and, and Nick, you mentioned UK investors, uh, you know, care about the p and I, I do a lot of AIM investing and UK investors also care about the balance sheet. And I think what's going to matter more for this space is commercial viability at scale. In other words, Amaris is doing this 200,000 liter uh, ferment and it's totally sold out on its CBG. Roy is doing the same thing with Genomatica and kind of, there's already people lining up to buy it. So I think what's going to matter more than kind of revenue in year one, year two, year three is how, uh, how much are we sold? How built out are we? Uh, and can we meet it? By the way, the risk to this industry, we talked about this first mover advantage work, it's cash, right? Ginkgo, right? DNA just came public with two plus billion dollars of excess cash. Anyone can buy their way in, right? You can you just buy your way in. So that's the risk. You just got to show there's commercial scale that's achievable and that the partners are choosing to believe in. Like Nick's saying, when the big logos start to show up, that's going to be the real seismic shift. And I think that's going to happen within the next two years to three years. And I think the other thing that, that these companies, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, are producing is, is IP. Um, and that's, Randy, certainly, I don't know which AIM companies you've invested in over the years. I'm guessing mining, oil and gas technology, the usuals. But yeah, what seems to differentiate particularly 
the guys on on this call and the others in the space is the ability to generate an IP portfolio. And that's what GW was so incredibly successful at doing. And that's why investors made a lot of money if they bat the story early. So that's another thing that London and Randy, you know, this is your day job. I'm just an interested watcher of 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 opportunities. But the IP space here is just fascinating. So, Roy, so when uh, I'm investors are asking what they should look for in a company uh, delivering you know, the, the sales uh, ramp, presumably um, IP is actually one of the things that investors should be looking for. Absolutely. And, you know, my perspective on these barriers to entry, not only is this the cutting edge of science, uh, not only is scaling up from lab to actual commercial production very, very difficult, but there's already been a vast amount of IP that's been generated in this space by the existing players. So I believe it's going to be very difficult for a new entrant to come in and operate uh, with freedom to operate. Freedom to operate is the most important aspect of IP. It's the flip side of the patent coin. It means that by doing what you're doing, you're not stepping on anyone else's patents because if you are, they can put you out of business. So ask yourself the question, is this company, is this investment, do they have freedom to operate? That's the first question you should ask. And after that, you can ask, and do they have a protectable IP portfolio? Yeah. So, um, you know, let's not forget the, the freedom to operate point. Trevor, what about you? What, in your view, should investors be looking for? I'll echo a lot of what Roy just said. Um, FTO is the most important aspect of, of our patent portfolio. Um, there's a number of ways that one can ultimately arrive at a solution to biosynthetically producing uh, anything, cannabinoid or otherwise, um, but making sure that you've got a fair way uh, to walk down uh, is very important. Uh, and that's, frankly, we have a, an entire team of individuals who focus on that aspect of our business. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, again, just to reiterate a point Roy just made, is doing this at the bench in the lab, uh, the engineering aspect of it uh, is challenging. Uh, but what is even more challenging is engineering in such a way at the lab that you can ultimately move through uh, to pilot and, uh, and ultimately at scale. Um, you know, today we're at 10,000 liters uh, quite comfortably uh, and anticipate moving to probably something on the order of 50 to 100,000 liters uh, next year. Um, and being able to show that, um, not just for investors, but also obviously for customers and partners, uh, is a very important aspect and a big focus of, of what we do as well. And something that, frankly, we've demonstrated this year. A very quick question uh, uh, for you. Um, uh, while you're while you're there, which somebody's asking uh, here, um, why is it taken so long to work out how to biosynthesize cannabinoids? But I'm not sure that it has taken so long. It's just that they've come to the come to it to notice relatively recently. Would that be true? I yeah, think there's two. Sorry. Sorry, I'll go quick, Roy, and then you can. So, I first of all, biosynthesis is still relatively new technology. Um, you know, it's still evolving. It's still very much in the early days, uh, and so there's a lot of very fascinating work that we're doing uh, that is cutting edge just in biosynthesis alone. Forget about cannabinoids. Um, but then the other part of it, which is you know the, the elephant in the room, the big obvious glaring thing, is it's been illegal. Uh, so being able to work on or produce cannabinoids in the States, you need a schedule one license from the DEA, uh, in Canada up until two or three years ago, you needed, a basically the equivalent, uh, from the office of controlled substances here in Canada. Uh, and so the legalization, the removal of the stigma has allowed biotech companies like Creo and ourselves to ultimately, uh, be able to work on this, uh, on this type of project. Roy. Yeah, no, I've got a bit more of a sciencey uh, uh, answer to this. So, you know, um, biosynthesis started in the 70s with Genentech. And for a long time, really, all we were doing were using micro microbial cells to produce proteins. 
And what you need to do to make a cannabinoid is much more complicated than just making a protein. A protein is an enzyme. You need to string together 15 to 20 different enzymes and having them balanced in the right way and making sure that the cell doesn't react to that and try and get rid of your pathway. There's a huge engineering aspect to this. And the biological sciences, which have been really propelled forwards by this revolution of the more than exponential fall in the cost of DNA sequencing, the ability, new tools to actually edit DNA, and, and the fall in the cost of synthesizing DNA, which are driving the biology revolution. Um, uh, uh, you know, th these tools have now enabled us to, to work much better with, with what we're doing with the cell. But biology is still an experimental science. We haven't got uh, to where physics is, for example, where we can model and predict and understand things very well. So there's a lot of the trial and error. There's a lot of experimentation that still has to happen in biology. And that's why it is not only cannabinoids are one of the hardest things to biosynthesize, but it's still a very experimental uh, uh, science. And so requires time and a lot of expertise. Uh, thank you. Um, Randy, I'm now going to come to the oracle <laughs> in terms of what do you look for in uh, when you invest in this space and what would you advise investors to look for? Well, I, I think that's a wonderful question, given what Roy just said, because the, the, the hardest thing that generalists, like I'm not a scientist by background, uh, have to kind of get over is the phrase biosynthetic right? Synthetic biology. It's a scary phrase. And like Roy was just saying, another way of phrasing it, and I know Nick, you mentioned engineering organisms before, but you could just call it advanced biology, right? All of the advances in science that we've had with CRISPR, with AI, with big data have just come to this moment in time where there's this opportunity that didn't exist at scale. I mean, Roy's right. Biology is iterative, right? Genes beget genes beget genes. But that hasn't changed in 5 billion years. We can just do it faster, right? And one of the, the big questions I get is, well, isn't this GMO, genetically modified organisms? Yeah, this is the definition of GMO. Let's not bury the lead. Like this is an important thing. But we forget that the reason we're all on this Zoom call today is that a couple of eons ago at the dawn of agriculture, humans started messing with biology to get cows and things to become the agriculture era that became. So I think the things that people need to look for, and we've talked about it here a lot, is certainly the moat, right? What's the moat and what's the runway? So you have an IP moat and what's your runway for potential revenue growth over time? And although Creo and, and Willow are small companies, relatively speaking, I think they're going to be multiples bigger over time. And certainly if you look at some of the players in the space like Ginkgo, Ginkgo, DNA, largest back in history, $17.5 billion raised. And when you look at their tapestry that hung from the New York Stock Exchange, they had a picture of a T-Rex. And I said to, uh, said to someone, well, if they could really make a Tyrannosaurus Rex, you, the, the concept of biosynthetic is you can make anything, then it's probably worth the crazy kind of revenue multiples that it trades at today. Uh, we're big in a, in a company called Amaris, which trades at a, you know, less than 10% of, uh, of DNA because valuation matters to us. So I think if you kind of lay a valuation paradigm on the potential of the space, you can get some really interesting uh, opportunities. Uh, Nick, I've got a quick question for you, which has come from uh, the audience, um, which is, if cannabinoids uh, are going to be used in something like toothpaste, will they be included in the list of ingredients as cannabinoids, or will there be a euphemism used? And that I'm, is, that's I, I'm an interesting still regulatory point, isn't it? I'm still contemplating Jurassic Park coming to life with Randy. <laughs> no, I'm a, uh, I'm a biologist. I say no. <laughs> no? Oh, you've just ruined so my what afternoon. Would you, what would you feed a Tyrannosaurus, for heaven's sake? Well, I, I suppose they're meat well, eating, but Brontosaurus. Sure. Well, I heard, Vivian, I heard there's some dog food you could feed it. Yes. <laughs> Cabbages. So, you know. Sorry, right. I... I, I, I um, just quickly, because we're coming to the end now. Beyond my expertise, packaging, law, uh, et cetera, but I would expect, and I, I would expect it to be called what it is. Um, if there's a cannabinoid and it's an active ingredient in whatever it is that you're consuming it, and it's going to be listed in the list of ingredients. And that, actually, that, that illustrates that there's a way to go in these uh, markets 
to make sure, I mean, we've talked about regulation in the broader sense of, um, uh, of cannabinoids, but actually more specific product legislation, because there isn't uh, much out there uh, at the moment. And there are quite a lot of products, it has to be said, that probably don't contain any cannabinoids or, or some kind of mixture and are not what they seem. Are you looking forward to there being more regulation in the space, Roy? Um. <clears throat> I think I, I, I think yes. I, I have a slightly different perspective here. I think there are clear regulations today that govern ingredients and and labeling, etc. Um, and and to, to your earlier question, the definition actually is the purity level. If your ingredient is more than ninety five percent pure when you put it in, you have to label it as such. If it's less you can label it as something else. So you can label something made from sugar that's not 95% pure as cultured dextrose, for example. So the regulations exist today. The problem that we have is that it's a bit of a wild west. And a lot of the companies, it's a fragmented market, are simply disregarding uh, uh, the regulations and not putting the quantities they're saying in there, et cetera. And, and that's really what needs to happen. We need to come back to enforcing the very good regulations that we already have around foods and beverages and cosmetics and ingredients and labeling and all that kind of good stuff. So I'm getting the impression from all of you First, that this is a sector which is very rapidly growing and that also biosynthesis is really kickstarting this to very considerable heights. Uh, Randy, would you agree? Vivian, as always, I agree with everything you say. <laughs> totally true. It's a good summary, right? That's a great place to kind of wind it down. It's we're on the cusp of a new day. And people are just slowly starting to realize it. It's wonderful that you were able to kind of focus on this for this hour to bring some broader attention to it. Um, Nick, is that true? I'm a buyer. <laughs> you're, you're a buyer. Um, Roy and no, you're all joking aside, Vivian. Uh, for me, it, this, is, this has been a journey from, I met Roy six weeks ago. It, it, if I hadn't really heard of it, then you've got a pretty good guess that in the UK, this is not something that people are discussing over their cornflakes in the morning. Um, but I've spent quite a lot of time looking at it over the last couple of months. And and it, it, it I don't think cannabis is going away. I think yeah, in Europe, and Trevor mentioned right at the beginning that Europe is his market, we are just beginning. And if this enables production of cannabinoids at scale, with purity without legal risk, then that that PepsiCo could pick up and stick in their Pepsi Max, then this must be the beginning of a new day. I love that saying, Randy. I'm nicking that. <laughs> Pepsi Pepsi Max plus plus plus. Um, Roy and Trevor, I know that you are obviously going to say <laughs> being the firm here, but uh, I just want to leave the last word uh, to you. So let's start with you, Trevor. Where, where do you think this is going and, and is biosynthesis really going to rocket fuel um, the cannabinoid market? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the, there, and there's several reasons why. Um, obviously, the purity we've talked about, um, you know, the ESG angle is very important uh, for these ingredient companies to ultimately source ingredients. Um, but then supply chain management, um, you know, there's always a discussion around, oh, biosynthesis, great for cost of goods sold uh, numbers. But more important than that is, is supply chain. Um, and that's really where uh, a lot of cost savings can actually occur. Uh, and that's where companies like ourselves uh, can ultimately provide that steady supply chain solution uh, for large ingredient companies who know that every time we turn a 50,000 liter tank, they're going to get a certain amount of product out. And that happens on a 10 day cycle. Uh, so right. I'm going to I'm gonna have to stop yep, you there right. because we've got to the end of our time. But Roy, I'm going to give you the last literally two words. And I know you, Roy Lipsky. So it really does have to be two words. <laughs> All right. Biosynthesis is the future. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. Um, that was more than two words. It should have been <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, I'm going to be the one now to say goodbye and to thank um, our stalwart band of panellists, who I think have not only outlined very well the background uh, to this whole field, but have shown you some of the potential for the future. Thank you so much for listening and watching. Bye for now.